blessing us on this cool day. You see, I got on my sweatshirt yesterday. We were in shorts and a t-shirt, and now today, <laughs> we got on a sweatshirt. Uh, but not, not our guest pastor. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Let's go. One of the pastors from the 64th, that's right, Port Elizabeth, South Africa. I tagged him last week. He watched it. All he could do for the entire week was talk about how good Pastor Jonathan was. So he sent me a message and he said, Bishop, when you all go live, please send it to me. Send it to me. So I'm going to do this introduction and I'm going to send it to him. All right. You have your tools. Have your tools. Fresh piece of paper ready to be filled. Uh, and we can't do Bible study without our Bible. So make sure that you have your Bible and you're ready. And I'm going to tell you where to turn. Acts chapter number two. That's right. Acts chapter number two and the pastor will lead us. Now, our theme, brothers and sisters, for the year is surrendering to sacrifice because we recognize that God calls us to sacrifice. And if a sacrifice doesn't cost you anything, it is not a sacrifice. I saw... Pastor Jonathan Hayes, get on a plane. He, he took a picture. Him and his family flying to Hawaii. He is in Hawaii on Powerhouse Bible study. That's a sacrifice. So I was talking to him at, at 12 o'clock, and I, I just Googled, well, what time is it in Hawaii? 6 a.m. I said, oh, man, you go on vacation to sleep in. And we're talking. He's like, no, I'm wide awake. And we've been talking through the day. I tell you what, I know that God is going to honor the pastor for taking time during his vacation to deliver the word of God. I want to say thank you to his wife. I want to say thank you to his children for allowing hubby and daddy to teach Bible study to us on tonight. Again, brothers and sisters, please, please, please press share, press share. This is a blessing all the way from, well, he'll tell you exactly where in Hawaii he is. I let him do that part. He is the senior pastor of the Ark Church, and we welcome Ark tonight. God bless you. Welcome. Thank you for sharing your pastor with me. He is my friend. He is my brother. He is the pastor for the next three Wednesday nights, the Honorable Pastor Jonathan Nathaniel Hayes. We're in your hands, sir. God bless you. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Or as they say here in Hawaii, aloha and mahalo. I am in, uh, it is, Oahu, Hawaii, um, in, the, in the city of Waikiki, and I was going to do this outside, Oceanside, because I thought that'd be nice. Um, but I don't have enough, um, what's it called, melanin in my skin. And uh, I have already turned into a lobster just in the couple, <laughs> couple days that I have been here. My wife is Ojibwe Indian, and so her skin can handle the sun a bit better than my Viking Norseman skin can handle it. So uh, thank you all for giving me this opportunity to get out of the sun and uh, forgive me for not taking you to the beautiful ocean side for our Bible study. Amen. All of that said, I want to give honor to the Lord. Of course, he's the head of my life. I want to give honor to all of the leadership of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the world. I want to give honor to Bishop Gwendolyn Weeks, uh, not only Bishop, but as my friend, and uh, I am honored to um, to work with her and to get in the harness, get in the yoke, and see the work of God accomplished in New England. Can you say amen? I want to thank you all uh, for turning with me to, uh, to Acts chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 41 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. And if you have your Bibles there, say amen. And if you didn't bring your Bible, say oh me. <laughs> oh me. All right, let's read Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. So those who received the word were baptized, 
They're added to the day that to the church that day about three thousand souls. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things common. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and dis distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending in the temple and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those that were being saved. We want to direct your attention back up to Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So these are the four pillars of the first church. And that's what we're going to study tonight, pillar number two, fellowship. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would unite us together in communion, in koinonia, in spiritual fellowship. Lord, though we may be logging on electronically, Lord, you can use this just like you, uh, you can use any other thing that you've created. Lord, everything, Lord, originates with you. So we ask, Lord, that uh, through this digital media that you will anoint uh, the ears of the hearers, anoint the words that are anointed of old that come out of my mouth, Lord, as your anointing bears witness and uh, guides and directs this Bible study. Lord, we'll give you all the praise and the glory and the honor for it in the mighty and awesome name of Jesus Christ. So would everybody say amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to do a quick review. Is that all right? We're going to look back at uh, last week. We talked about uh, the, the first of the four pillars. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the apostles' doctrine. Now, we talked about what doctrine is. The word doctrine simply means the teachings. And we talked about how we are apostolic Pentecostals. And as apostolic Pentecostal believers, we want to live out first century Christianity in the 21st century. We believe that if God ever did it, he still does. If God ever filled people with the Holy Ghost, he still does. If God ever worked miracles, he still does. If he ever opened blinded eyes, if he ever unstopped the deaf ears, he is still doing it today. And if he has ever saved the lost souls, he is doing that through his church today. And we want to be that 21st century expression of that first century Christianity. That's what it means to be apostolic. That's what it means to be Pentecostal. And we want what they had. So we want to embrace our spiritual heritage. And we, we, we know that in order to have what they had, we need to do what they did. Amen. And these are the four pillars of apostles doctrine, fellowship, breaking bread and prayers. And last week we talked about doctrine. We talked about truth. Truth sanctifies the church. Jesus prayed. In the garden of Gethsemane, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so we talked about what that doctrine is, what the teachings of the church are. Uh, you're teaching something. Everybody's teaching something. So don't tell me you don't teach doctrine because we all teach something, and that's what doctrine is, is the teachings. And I, I want to be teaching the teachings of the first century church. I don't believe in doctrinal evolution. I don't believe that God's gospel has changed. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what they preached on the day of Pentecost is what you're going to hear being preached out of Bishop Week's mouth, out of my mouth, and out of every other minister in this fellowship's mouth. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So we talked about the full gospel last week, and we talked about the Godhead. Now, this is a good spring-off point to bring us to what we're going to talk to this week, uh, talk about this week, because you'll remember last week when I talked about the Godhead, 
I, I, I noted what Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31, was the greatest of all commandments. He said, the greatest of all commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Then he went on to say, you're going to love that Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And then the second commandment is like the first, he said. Now, what's the second pillar that we're studying? We're studying fellowship. And Jesus here says that the second commandment is like the first, and he brings us from doctrine, from truth, into fellowship and into koinonia and communion with one another. Do you see how the first and second pillar are the first and second commandments that Jesus gave? Jesus said the first one is God is one and you need to love him. Amen. And that's the apostles' doctrine. The second one is you need to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that's the second pillar of the church, Acts 2.42. The, uh, uh, the 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 pillar of uh, uh, of fellowship of koinonia, and so that's where we're going to on tonight. Amen. Amen. So Jesus said the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself, and then he went on to say against these against these great commandments there is no law. Now what does that mean? If you look at the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, what you'll discover is the first five are about your relationship with God and the way you interact with God, and the second five are about the way you interact with man. And so what Jesus did here is he summarized the entirety of the law because he didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law, and he summarizes it all by saying, you know what? If you can love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and if you can love your neighbor as much as you love yourself, then there is no need of any law. Think about it. If people love God and love their neighbor as much as they love themselves, there would never need to be one law written. The only reason why we have to have laws is because people don't love God the way that they should love God, and that people don't love their neighbor the way that they are supposed to love their neighbor. Now, uh, you all know me by now. If you were here last week and you know I'm, I'm a doctoring guy, I like to dig in deep into this stuff and and yet, what, what I find is a lot of people say all the religions of the world are just the same. How many has heard that before? All religions of the world are the same. They all have the golden rule, and the golden rule is what? You know, to, to do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Now, that's nice, and, and that's, that's even uh, in the teachings of Christ as well. But what goes beyond the golden rule is the great commandments. What, what what Christianity has that goes over and above the golden rule is the great commandment. See, we aren't just required to do, right? we are required to feel. We are not just required and commanded to act. We are commanded to have the heart behind the action. Amen? So the golden rule says, do this, don't do that. But the great commandment says love, because if you love them as much as you love yourself, you're going to do unto them. That's the heart of it. People think that the Old Testament was hard. And I tell them all the time, no, 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 the New Testament's harder than the Old Testament. And this is why. Because in the Old Testament, you just had to keep the rules. But in the New Testament, God looks beyond your actions. He looks into your heart. He explores the motivations of your heart. It's not enough to be charitable. We must be charitable out of a willing and giving heart. It's not enough to do good. You have to do it because your heart loves people, loves your brother, loves your sister, not from some mandate, but from the mandate of the burden of the heart that God places upon your heart, that burden of love that he gives you for your brothers and sisters. Somebody say amen. Amen. So let's look at this word. 
fellowship. The word fellowship in the Greek, we, it, it, the Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. Koinonia. And the word koinonia can be translated in the following ways. And I'm going to say this really slow for those of you who are writing this down. Koinonia is the word in Acts 2.42 for fellowship. And it translates a social intercourse, a communion, a joint participation, or a sharing. And I'm going to say that again. Koinonia literally translates to a social intercourse, a communion, a joint participation, or a sharing. And I want to focus on that last definition of koinonia, sharing. Everybody say sharing. 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 If you look at, uh, at what we read uh, beyond verse 42, and you look at the rest of the chapter that we read when we opened up, You'll see that what uh, Luke is doing in, at, at the end of Acts is he's giving you a glimpse at what the next three chapters of the book of Acts is going to be about. Acts 2 verses 43 through 47 are just a summary. It, it, it's a, a thesis statement, if you would, of what is going to happen in the three chapters that follows on. He talks about how they're selling the things that they have to take care of one another, to look after one another. And we see this uh, even more so when you flip over a couple pages to Acts chapter 4 and verses 32 through 37. Let me read that for you. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them, of, uh, neither said any of them that all of the things which they possessed was their own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. And now he circles back to the theme again. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands and houses, sold them, brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and dis distribution was made every man according to his need. According to his need. Now, there's a few things I want to point out before we get into the nitty gritty of this. I want to say just on the surface that when the when, when they became Christians, when, when when they were converted to Christianity, and right here we're in the very beginning, we're in the cradle of the church. When they pulled away from the world, when they we we don't just withdraw from the world, we have to withdraw to one another. It's not enough to separate ourselves from the world. We withdraw from the world, but we must withdraw to one another. And that's what the first century church did. Let me tell you something. You can be a great church at soul winning, but if you don't learn how to plug people into the community, if you don't learn how to make them a part of the church family, if you don't learn how to make them a part of, to make them feel like this church is their home, they're not going to stay. It doesn't matter how real and how exciting that uh, experience that they had when they first came to the Lord, they need to feel like you are family. Why? Because we're asking them to leave. Father, mother, leave the world, leave the social network, the, the drinking, the clubs, the bars, uh, all of these things that used to define who they were in, in, in their previous life. When we, we, we ask them to come away from that stuff, to withdraw from that stuff, they need something to withdraw to. And it needs to be the church. It needs to be the church. I, as someone who loves truth and loves the word, I can tell you, that if it were up to me, I'd love to say that most people come to church because of the truth. Most people come to church because of the word and they're seeking truth and they're seeking doctrine. I'd love to say that. But the truth of the matter is, 
it's the second pillar that most people come to church for, and that's the truth. The truth is, is that most people go where they feel like they are a part. Most people go where they feel like they're family, they feel like they're connected, they feel like the people there care about them. And ha it, I would love to say that they go until they find the right church that's preaching truth, but that's not usually how it goes. It usually goes, this is my home. This is where I feel connected. This is where I feel like I am a part of the community. New converts need to feel community. They need community. They need your church to be their home. So whoever is in this group right now that is part of uh, uh, the welcoming committee at the church and part of the following up ministry, reaching out to visitors who come, I want to tell you that your ministry is as important as the preacher that's preaching behind the pulpit. Because if people aren't, if you're not following up, if you're not reaching out to them and say, you know, they're still forming their opinion of their visit to your church for the first couple days after they leave that first service. And so while they're still forming that opinion about their visit to your church, you got to reach out to them, tell them how glad you were to have them, and tell them that you're excited and that they're only a visitor once. They're only a visitor once. And then after that, they're what? Their family. After that, their family. So in the in the first century church, what we find is that size matters, smaller is better. Because what we see that because what did they do? Although they met together for worship and praise in the temple, they went from house to house sharing these common meals and communing with one another and, and having Bible studies with one another on a smaller, more intimate level. When people say are you a successful pastor, Bishop Weeks? When people say, are you a successful pastor? When they ask me that, I well, do you mean quantity or do you mean quality? Right? Because it, we, we can have a church filled with people who are coming just to get their, 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 their fix for the weekend and, 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 and to get their religious uh, checkbox marked so that they can go out throughout the day or you can have a core group of people who are truly, truly changed, truly converted, truly on fire for God, truly lovers of truth and lovers of the word. And so that's what matters. And what we see in the first century church is they started right off in Acts chapter 2, a benevolence fund. They started right off in Acts chapter 2 with a benevolence fund. Why was the first church so needy financially. So I, I want you to put yourself in their mindset. Now, you remember in the first part of Acts chapter 2, Medes, Parthians, dwellers of Met Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, Pontus, Pamphylia, uh, uh, what, what else was there? There was Egyptians and, and, and uh, Italians, Romans, Greeks, from all over the world. They had converged on Jerusalem for the holy day. And then they had been saved by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now what? What do they do? All these people who had traveled on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, are they to go home? If they go home to Pamphylia, if they go home to Pontus, if they go home to Rome, if they go home to Greece, there's no church for them there. There's only one church in the entire world. And it's there in Jerusalem. So what did they do? So many of them decided to stay in Jerusalem. And that's why you had so many Greek-speaking Christians in the book of Acts dwelling in Jerusalem. They all stayed there because, as, as Peter said to Jesus, go, go where? You have the words of eternal life. How are we going to go home when there's no church for us to go home to? And so you had an influx of a lot of people from all the nations around the world coming into the church at Jerusalem. And this created a little bit of an economic crisis for the church. Those Christians who were Jewish and were from Jerusalem in the area, they had financial means. But those who had traveled and had come there from elsewhere, they were in need. Can somebody say amen? Is anybody connecting these dots yet? Amen. Amen. So I love what happened in Acts chapter 6. 
in Acts chapter 6, what we discover is, is that the Greek Christians, those who had moved to Jerusalem to be a part of the church, the Greek widows were being overlooked in this distribution of funds. Now, that's not the part I love. I, I'll, I'll get to the part I love just here in a second. Uh, so the, the Greek widows were being overlooked in the distribution of the wealth of the church. And when this was brought to the apostles' attention, the apostles said, hey, we're focusing on pillar number one. We're focusing on the preaching. We said, so choose you out from among you seven, fill, seven men full of the Holy Ghost that they may do this. These were the first deacons, the first seven deacons of the church. Now, this is what I love, and this is what's beautiful. Are you ready? All seven of these men that the first century church chose, every one of them had a Greek name. Now, what does that mean? What that means is, is when they saw that they were inadvertently discriminating against the Greeks within the church, what did they do? They overcompensated for it by selecting seven Greek speakers to oversee the distribution of the wealth of the church. They wanted to make sure that there was no approach that could be brought against the church. So what did they do? They said, we're sorry, Greek widows, that you've been overlooked in the distribution, so we're going to set Greek men over the distribution from here on out to make sure this does not happen again. This is koinonia. This is fellowship. This is sharing. And this is the principle and, 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 and the, the paragon that the first century church sets up for us so that we are to live this out. Amen? Choose you out from among you, seven men, full of the Holy Ghost, all seven Greeks, all seven. And this is, the, this is the first century church's way of saying, we see we messed up, we see that there was some discrimination, and we're fixing it right now. Amen. Amen. Now look at, uh, look at this next point. A lot of, a lot of, uh, of well-meaning Bible teachers and preachers will try to suggest to you that the first century church taught, believed, and practiced communism. Now, I want to clarify here. There's a big difference in governmentally, uh, the, the idea of, of communism uh, governmentally in Christian community. I'm going to say that again. There's a big difference in communism as an institution and Christian communion. And I'm going to break that down for you. The, the, the motto of communism, the idea that they've tried over and over and over again throughout the world is this. From each according to their ability, to each according to their need. That's the idea that, and it's a, it's a nice idea. The idea behind com communism is from each you take all of their excess and to each you give according to their need. It's a nice idea. Uh, the problem is, is that human beings are selfish and human beings are lazy. So in a secular world, in a secular world, if, 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 so, if someone's told, if you work really hard and you strive really hard, you're still not going to get ahead. If you devote your life and, and, and you work harder than anyone else, guess what? You're not going to get ahead. You're still going to be the same as everybody else. The incentive disappears in a secular society, right? And, 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 and on the opposite side, if you know that if you don't work hard, you're going to get the same as the man who's working very hard, then it disincentivizes your desire to work. That's secular communism. That's not what the church was talking about here. And to really spell out the difference, the Apostle Paul made it very clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, he says this. Each one of you must give... As you purpose in your heart, not as you were required to, but as you as you have purpose in your heart, and not grudgingly. It's not something that's being forced on you, not something that you're doing because you have to do, not under compulsion, he says. For God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Giver. And this is what you have to understand. 
we know from Acts 12, 12, not everyone sold their land. Not everyone sold their house. Not everyone sold their possessions. But those who purposed in their heart to do so, not grudgingly, not under compulsion, but as God laid it on their heart to do, because God loves a cheerful giver. That is the difference. The difference is, is that we take care of our brother and sister, not because Big Brother or Uncle Sam tells us to. We take care of our brothers and sisters because it is the love of our heart and the burden of our heart to do so. Hallelujah. 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 In Acts chapter 5, uh, we read, uh, it, says, it begins, Acts chapter 5 begins with the word but. But Ananias and Sapphira. We hear about the story of Ananias and Sapphira. The reason why the word but's there is because we got a positive example and then we got a negative example of giving. The positive example was Barnabas. Barnabas had land. He sold it. He laid at the apostles' feet, and the apostles distributed the money to those who needed it. And Ananias and Sapphira said they were going to sell their land and give the money to the church. But what they did, what they said and what they did wasn't exactly the same. Now, I'm going to assume that you guys know this story, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on it. But there's some things I want to point out. When, when they lied to the preacher, they lied to God. That's the first thing that I want to point out. When they lied to Peter, Peter didn't say, why did you lie to me? He said, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? And a few verses later, he said, you have not lied to man, you lied to God. Amen? So this needs, to, this needs to impress upon you the importance of being truthful and honest and your interaction with the man and woman, the spiritual leaders that God has placed in your life. You have not lied to man, you lied to God. I can, see, uh, I can see Ananias saying, I wouldn't lie to God, I just lied to you, Peter. That's not how it works in the kingdom of God. Well, I want you to notice what Peter says. He says, he says, before you sold the land, wasn't it your land? You didn't have to sell it. This, this isn't a government of communism. We are not forcing you to give this to the church. And then watch what he says after that. He says, then after you sold the land and you had the money, wasn't the money yours? So again, this wasn't something they were being required to do. It was the, the problem was that he lied to the man of God. He lied to the church. God hates hypocrisy. God hates people who give to be seen giving and want to be uh, perceived as giving more than they're giving. Be honest. Be truthful. Give as, it, just like the widow's might. He's not judging you based on how much you gave. He's judging you based on how much you had left over after you gave. Amen. And how much you trusted him in the giving. The problem was is that he pretended to give all when he had not given all. I, I, I think we've got a lot of people that, that say, oh, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have Bishop Weeks for a pastor, if I had Peter? Wouldn't it be nice if I had Peter instead of, of Pastor Hayes uh, for a pastor, wouldn't that be nice? Let me tell you what Peter did. Peter pronounced the death sentence upon this saint in his church for lying about how much the offering was. And when he fell dead in the sanctuary, he had four ushers carry him out and bury him. He must have been a big guy because it took him about three hours to bury this fellow. And Peter didn't even notify the next of kin that he had passed away. So finally, his wife walks in the door of the church three hours later, and Peter says, how much did you sell the land for? She lied to him. And he said, why have you purposed in your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? The feet, the ushers that carried out your husband are waiting to carry you out as well. I think you probably better be glad that you don't have a pastor. Some, some people better be glad they don't have a pastor like Peter. Because Peter makes it plain. Peter makes it clear. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. This is what he says. He says, the end of all things is near. And if he can say it 2,000 years ago, it's even more so true now. Therefore, be clear-minded, be sober, so that you can pray, and above all, 
love one another deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. And here's the key. Show hospitality to one another without complaining. Now, I'm going to say something here that's going to uh, maybe maybe cause a little bit of a hitch in some of you, but I just want you to let it let it marinate for a little while and let, let it settle in, and, and, and you might see that there's some truth in it. Um, Peter, when he was going up to the temple, and there was a lame man laying there, and Peter said, look on us, and he looked on them to receive alms. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to point something out here. We know that, that people in the church were selling their extra land, selling their excess, giving it to the church to take care of the needy. So why did Peter say, silver and gold have I none, when you know that people were selling stuff and laying it at the apostles' feet for distribution? Are you ready? It's because charity begins at home. Charity begins at home. We need to be a benevolent church to the community. We need to reach out to, to, to the people around the world, but we need to be taking care of the widows in our church first. We need to be taking care of the fatherless in our church first. And until so th that needs to be, we need to be known for our love for each other, our charity for one another, and our ability to take care of one another. If one of us is lacking, now I'm not talking about someone, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be like this generation, but I'm going to be that way. This generation, sometimes they just, you know, they just want to, you know, stay on mama's couch and play video games until they're 30, 35 years old. Um, but uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about someone who's hard pressed, falling on hard times, who's doing the best they can and not able to make ends meet. When we've got those in our church, it is, it, it is a bad mark. It is a stain on our church because we need to be taking care of our church family. We need to be taking care of those that God has entrusted us. Why? Because we're family. Because we're family, we need to take care of one another. Silver and gold have I none. What Peter was saying was, it's not for you. It's not for you. This silver and this gold, I need to take care of the widows in the church. I need to take care of the orphans in the church. Uh, we, we've got people we need to take care of in the church. But what I do have for you is salvation. What I do have for you is a miracle. What I do have for you is a healing. Now, I, I, I have to say that I get so inspired and encouraged when I see your church uh, doing all the great work that it does in the community, caring for people, reaching out to people. Uh, we had a, a benevolence fund in the church. I pastored in Belfast, and we had a, a food pantry. And I would tell people uh, when, when they'd reach out, I'd say, yes, yes, come, and we'd fill them up with groceries. And before, we, before they'd leave, we'd say, look, we, we have a very small church and a very small food pantry. The next time you come, you have to come to a church service. And, and, and you're only a visitor once. So once, once you come to that church service, then you're a part of our family. And we will just continue helping you out and continue taking care of you. Amen. But we, we, it's great to be, it's great to have a social gospel where we're reaching out to the world, but that can't be all that there is. We have to partner that social gospel with preaching salvation and getting them into the church. Amen. Amen. I mean, what is the law of friendship? The law of friendship is this. You never lack for anything as long as it's something that I have excess in. That's the law of friendship. The law of friendship is you will never want for anything that I have because everything that I have is yours. Isn't that the law of friendship that Jesus gave us? We were wanting in righteousness we were wanting in holiness. We were wanting in, in salvation. And all that he has is ours for the taking. Hallelujah. 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 So I want to say this. I want you to, 
usually, how, how many years using the King James? Raise your hand. I, I usually use the King James. Bless God, if it was good enough for Peter and Paul, it was good enough for me. Um, there are a lot of good translations out there, and there are a lot of translations that are not so good. But I want you to look back at Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, and I want to point something out to you as we're drawing to a close here. I want to point something out to you that you, you might have missed. Now, various translations give Acts 2.42 differently, but I believe this is one of the areas where the King James Version nailed the Greek translation just right. I want you to notice, now the commas aren't there in the original language, so it has to be inferred from the words that are used. And so notice where the commas are in Acts 2.42. Notice there's no comma between apostles' doctrine and fellowship. But then there's a comma after fellowship. Everybody see that? Now, what is the point of that? Here's the point, okay? The point is, is that the fellowship also ties back to the apostles. You have the apostles' doctrine and the apostles' fellowship. And this is why after these people were saved, they all migrated to Jerusalem. They all moved there to be in fellowship with the apostles. Why am I pointing this out? Because you need to be in fellowship with your spiritual leadership. You need to be in communion. You need to be in right standing with your pastor. Uh, I, I, I saw something this week that said, look, church discipline is not God's sign to you that it's time to go start a new church. You know, every, th this mentality that I can get, you know, five or 10 people together and I can just go and do my own thing. We live in a generation that does not want to submit itself to authority, doesn't want to submit itself to discipline. Amen. But how, what is your relationship with your spiritual leader? What is your relationship with your pastor? What is your relationship with your bishop? Because you have to be in good standing. And they understood this, and that is why they not only continued in the apostles' doctrine, but they continued in fellowship with the apostles. In fellowship with the apostles. Because that's where they were getting their spiritual meat. That's where they were getting their doctrine. That's where they were getting their truth from. In Jeremiah chapter 12, in verse 5, we have a, a prophetic verse in Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 5 from the prophet Jeremiah. This is what he says. He says, if you run with the footmen and the footmen have worried you, how are you going to contend with horses? Now, I want to use this verse to just drive a point home to everybody to know. Blessed are the feet of them that carry the gospel, right? If you're running with your pastor and your pastor's worrying you, then how are you going to contend with the horses? What horses? Well, the book of Revelation tells me about four horsemen and four horses, and I don't want to contend with those horses. If you don't want to contend with those four apocalyptic horses, when I suggest to you that you not let your minister, your pastor, your footman worry you, wear you down. You need to stay in fellowship with your church. You need to stay in fellowship with your pastor. No man is an island, and you need to be with the church. The Apostle Paul told us we can't cut the nose off. We can't cut the ear off and expect it to live. We had this mentality in the church for so long. Me and Jesus got our own thing going on. No, you don't. And, 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 and th th me and Jesus got our, my own, our own thing going on. Let, let me tell you, Jesus didn't come and die on the cross for an individual. Now, let me caveat that by saying, if you were the only sinner in the world, I believe Jesus would have died on the cross for you. But hear what I'm saying. Jesus didn't come to save an individual. Jesus came to purchase a bride. Jesus came to purchase a church and to pull a church out of the world stay plugged in stay plugged in and stay submitted to your leadership in the apostles doctrine and in your fellowship with your apostles as well i've got a, a few 
uh, closing ideas here, but I'm going to turn it over to the bishop and let her uh, do some station identification. Come on, Cease. Let's clap and thank God for Pastor Jonathan. All the way from Hawaii, teaching Bible study when he can be, well, under a cabana. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Saints, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Minister Cynthia to go ahead and please put up the cash app, and I'm going to talk. This is, I, I love our God, Pastor Jonathan. It was as if you were in our six o'clock early morning prayer and exhortation. Minister Myrna Burns, it's line upon line, precept upon precept. I mean, pretty much everything that sh she exhorted us by the Holy Thank Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. The enemy tried to stop it last week, <laughs> but it had to be today. Come on, Bethel. It had <laughs> that God made it so that she would present at six o'clock. Come on, Saints, come on. <laughs> and then we come back at six o'clock at night and hear the same thing. Bethel, if we don't get it, us. Pastor Jonathan, you came to confirm. You came, the Bible says that one. And you watered, sir. And made by the power of the Holy Ghost. May Bethel become a church with Cornelia, with Cornelia in it, with the sharing. That was so powerful. I, I thank God. I, I just, Father, I thank you for the word, to Pastor. Thank you. I'm, I'm just, uh, my spirit is rejoicing and, and just thankful to the Lord for what he has done for the family of Bethel. Now, Pastor, uh, please, you have your comments. Again, thank your wife. Thank you, children, for sacrificing you to be with us in Hawaii. You, 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 you did good. You blessed us, Pastor. You blessed us immensely. Hmm. Yes. Okay, man. Thank you. Okay, Pastor, we're back in your hands. All right. The Bible tells us that we are to speak the truth in love. And again, we see the first and the second pillar of the four pillars of the church right there. The Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship. Speak the truth, but speak it in love. They, they, they have to go together. It's peanut butter and jelly, folks. They have to go together. We, 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 can ha we can have all of the truth and the doctrine, but if we have not love, we're a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Amen? We can understand all mysteries. We can have Apostles' Doctrine, but if we don't have the love, then, then, then we're out of place. And, and here's the key. We can be rock solid on truth in our churches, but if people don't feel like they're welcome, and if they don't feel like this is their home, if they don't feel like that you are eager and earnest in your desire to have them back, then chances are you're only going to see them two or three times, and then you're not going to see them again. Your church is a family, and as quickly as you can, you need to make them feel plugged in to that family and somebody say amen we used to sing this song uh um, and it's probably some hillbilly song that you guys have never heard because i'm from the sticks of appalachian mountains of tennessee but uh, we used to sing first john chapter four be love let us love one another the love is of god and everyone that loveth is born of god and know with God, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. So will be love. Let us love one another. John chapter 13 and verse 34 sums it all up. John chapter 13 and 34. Tried to say the best verse for last. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, by what? By our doctrine? By how much we shout? By how good the music is in our church? Um, by, 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 by how good our organ player is or 
or by uh, by how fancy our building is. No, 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 no. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you love, hallelujah, that you love one another as I have loved you. How is the world going to know looking on that you love your brother? How is the world going to know looking on that you love your sister? How are they going to know? Through sharing, through koinonia. Listen, someone in your church, if, if, you, if, you've got an, if you've got an extra car and someone in your church needs a car, you need to pray about what to do with that car. Amen? If someone in your church is trying and struggling, if someone in your community is trying and struggling and, and there are people in the church that have excess, it's time for them to step up and take care of the rest of the church who are in need. Beloved, let us love one another. They will know we are Christians by our love. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Koinonia. Let's share. Let's share. Speaking of koinonia, let's have some of that koinonia with the Holy Spirit right now. Let's have some communion with the Lord right now. Prayer. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for your presence. It's so real. Lord, though we are separated by time and space, that time, that space means nothing to you. Lord, for you fill all space. You are omnipresent. Lord, you are in Boston. You are in Maine. You are in uh, Hawaii. Lord, you are, you are in our hearts, Lord, and we are your temple. So I pray right now that you would unite us together. I pray right now, Lord, that the things that separate us, the things that uh, try to divide up your body, Lord, we rebuke them in the name of Jesus Christ. Anything that would seek to separate the body of Christ, to sever a member from the body of Christ, we speak against it right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, help us to have unity. Help us to speak the truth and to do it in love. Help us to be the church that not only preaches true doctrine, Lord, but embraces the, the stranger that walks in the door and makes them feel like this is their new family and this is their new home. Lord, we pray this in the mighty and awesome name of Jesus, knowing that you're working, knowing that you're moving, Lord, knowing that you're convicting us. Lord, this, this Bible study has been to my heart as much as it's been to anyone that I'm teaching to. Lord, help me to love, to love others more than I love myself. Help me, Lord Jesus, to, to, to make every person that walks through those church doors feel like I love them more than I love myself and that I, I, that I desire to see them there every service and in our fellowship. Lord, live your love out through me and through everyone that's hearing this sermon tonight. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen.